So hello everybody and welcome to my video about social semiotics and multimodality. So let's start with a question. Take a look at the canvas here, this painting by the New York artist Jean-Michel Basquiat. And ask yourself this question, how can I begin to talk about this painting? How can I begin to write about this painting? How can we analyze this painting? Well, I'm sure you agree there's a lot going on in this painting. So we have various images, we have various colors, we have text or written language. We also have text that has been crossed out. We also have these kind of black spaces. We have empty space on the canvas. We have stuff in brackets or parentheses. Um, so there are many signs and symbols and colors and lots of noise on the canvas. So it might be quite difficult to start speaking about a painting like this. So what we're going to look at today is a very general framework of how we can understand different acts of communication. Those acts of communication include that anything that human beings make. So it could be a painting, it could be a novel, it could be a YouTube video. Anything that a person made can be analyzed using social semiotics and multimodality. So let's have a look at it, how we use it, and what it means. Okay, so we're going to look at social semiotics and multimodality today. So first we will look at what semiotics are, or what the study of semiotics is, and we will look briefly at the two people that came up with this theory. Second, we will look at the difference between semiotics and social semiotics. So how did the use of semiotic theory change? And then finally, we will look at multimodality, what this means, why this is approach, why this approach is useful, and how it can be used together with social semiotics. So let's move on. And let's look first at what semiotics are. So simply, semiotics is the study of signs or symbols and their use and interpretation. So in semiotics, they use the word sign. I just use the word symbol here to make it easier for you to understand. But if you look at the pictures behind me or the images behind me, um, you can see that first we have um, the image for Wi-Fi or the sign for Wi-Fi. Second, we have the sign for Nike. Third, we have the sign for a cat as a picture. And then we have the same um, idea, cat represented in letters or a word in the English language. So all of these are signs and all of these uh, communicate a meaning of some kind. So let's have a look at it in a little bit more detail. So the two gentlemen behind me, Ferdinand de Saussure and Charles Sanders Pierce, both get credit for coming up with slightly different um, systems of semiotics. Uh, Ferdinand de Saussure was a Swiss linguist. He'd been very, very influential in French academic culture, particularly perhaps the most influential intellectual of the 20th century in France. The other gentleman behind me is Charles Sanders Pierce. Um, he made very significant contributions in many different fields. Many people consider him a genius. And he is well known as one of the three founders of American pragmatism with two other very well-known thinkers, John Dewey and um, William James. So there's a very brief introduction to the two people. Let's look at what they said in a little bit more detail. So let's start with de Saussure. So um, de Saussure is most famous for his idea that the sign combines two parts, okay? So the first part of the sign is called the signifier. And when we think about language, this is a series of letters in English, T-R-E-E, -E, or it's the sound of the word tree. So this is the form that the word has or the form that the word takes. 
The second part of the two part sign is the signified or what it means, or let's say the mental concept. So this is a two in one relationship, it's form and meaning. And the essential question is how is the meaning or the signified related to the signifier? Okay, so how does the form of the word tree relate to the meaning of the word tree? So it's form and meaning, essentially. So Sure said some other important things. So he was the first person to recognize the two-in-one nature of the sign. So this was one of his big contributions. Another thing that he said is very important is that the sign is arbitrary. This means there is no natural or logical connection between the sign that we use, the word that we use, and the meaning of the word. So in different languages, of course, we use different words to represent um, the same thing or the same object. So, for example, in English, we use tree, and in Korean, you would, of course, use the word namu. OK, but there is no necessary or natural or logical connection between the sign that we use, the word that we use and the thing that it means or the thing that it refers to. So this later leads on to a very important conclusion about cultures. Essentially, in postmodernism, um, people concluded that all cultures created meaning in their own unique ways. So this means essentially that there is no absolute truth about the world that can be expressed in language. The fact that different cultures create meanings in different ways suggests very, very strongly that, that there is no master culture, there is no master language. All cultures have their own ways of constructing the truth. That's truth with a small t, but there is no absolute truth. There is no big T truth that can be communicated in any language. OK, so let's have a look at Charles Sanders Peirce. So let's look first at the quotation. So the quotation is, the entire universe is perfused with signs. It's full of signs. Signs are everywhere. If it is not composed exclusively of signs. So it, he says it may even consist only of signs. There may be nothing else. He also said we can think only in signs. So we can communicate only in signs. And he also said, I think it helps to make what a sign is clearer. Anything can be understood as a sign as long as someone interprets the sign as having another meaning from the sign itself. So let's have a look at this in a very famous picture you probably know by the French artist René Magritte. So he wrote, Ceci n'est pas une pipe, meaning this is not a pipe. So of course, it is an image or a picture of a pipe and not the pipe itself. So you might also think of a map. Of course, the map and the territory or the land area that the map um, is about are two different things. You don't confuse those two things right. So this is essential when we want to talk about what a sign is. It has a meaning that somebody understands that is not the sign. OK, so let's move on and let's um, look at the last thing we need to look at in this section, which is denotation and connotation. So denotation is the dictionary definition of the word. Connotation is the social, emotional, imaginative meaning or association that the word has. So the denotative meaning of a red rose is that it's a red flower with sharp thorns. The connotative meaning of a red rose is something like romantic love, especially in Western cultures. So let's have a look at a word from Korean culture. So the word is ajuma. And the dictionary definition or the translation of the word ajuma in English is middle-aged lady. We also get the translation madam or mom. So already we have three different translations. 
Um, I can tell you that in my language, mom is generally used in the police force for an officer, female officer, more senior than you. So I don't think the word ajuma has that meaning in Korean. Um, also, the word madam has many different meanings. If you say she's a real madam, it means she has a very attitude, a very kind of strong attitude, um, an unpleasant attitude, perhaps. Madam also means prostitute, a sex worker. So we can see here um, a very different meaning in the translation. So the different culture gives a different meaning to these words. But even if we look at Korean culture, the word ajuma doesn't simply mean middle-aged lady. It may have all different kinds of meanings, uses, associations, and connotations. Sometimes we may be able to use the word in a respectful way. So a lady, I don't know her name. Maybe I can say this in a polite way to get her attention, maybe on public transport. Perhaps that is not so rude. I don't know, maybe it could be considered rude, depending on how I say it. Um, but also maybe a woman uses this word, perhaps it contains um, an idea of something she's not because she's younger than the Ajuma. So she sees herself as um, not middle-aged or perhaps she sees herself as fashionable. The Ajuma is not fashionable. And then we have connotations maybe like a sun cap, as in the photograph, maybe doing aerobics outside. Maybe also somebody who's paid to clean the house. I don't know. There could be many, many different connotations or meanings of the word ajuma. Maybe it encodes different meanings or evokes in the mind ways of dressing, ways of behaving, ways of speaking. So these could all be understood by different people in Korean cultures according to their age. Also, maybe according to their social status and also according to their life experience, the way they understand language and the world. So there are many, many different connotations or interpretations around a simple word. So let's have a look at social semiotics and what social semiotics is and how it differs from regular semiotics that we saw before. The Dishusu was very influential. Like I said, perhaps the most influential intellectual in France in the 20th century. So it became very important in anthropology, in sociology, also in philosophy, linguistics, and um, later in psychoanalysis. So it has been very, very influential. Firstly, in structuralism, which is essentially the analysis of the use of signs in different contexts. And later in post-structuralism, which simply said there are problems with the sign, um, but we cannot move beyond the sign. Um, so we need to recognize that we still have a relationship to this basic signified signifier pair. Um, so this is very important, and I still think very current in France, especially today. Um, Tosio was a linguist. Tosio was a linguist. OK, so he knew that signs were used in different contexts, but as outside language, but as a linguist, he focused on language. So he looked at the signifier as a linguistic phenomenon and the signified as a language based phenomenon. But with social semiotics, um, we attempt to move beyond this to look at non language based signs. OK, so we will look at these in more detail later on. The other problem with de Saussure's work was that it couldn't explain how language changed. So, of course, one of the main features of language and culture is that it changes and meanings change. But Saussure's theory was not able to explain this. So this is one of the things that social semiotics um, attempted to do. Um, in social semiotics, therefore, we look at acts of communication. So it's not simply language and language use. There are other ways that we communicate. So we communicate with bodily gesture. Uh, we communicate with other kinds of signs, especially in modern culture with images. And of course, these also have a meaning. Sounds also have a meaning. Ah, 
it has a meaning, right? Um, so also think about fruit. The color of the fruit is a sign. Is the, is the fruit ripe or unripe? Is it ready to eat? Is it not? So signs exist um, in many different non-linguistic contexts. So all of these things together, all of the different signs that people can use are called semiotic resources. So semiotic resources include numbers and language and images and wor words on a page, um, photographs and videos. So anything that a human being can use to communicate body language as well is seen as a semiotic resource, okay? So during the process of communication, meaning is communicated. So meaning is not something in the world that we can simply uncover or discover. Meaning is something that we create through our acts of communication with one another. So social semiotics, is a general framework for understanding and analyzing the various acts of communication that take place in all different media. So let's have a look at perhaps the most important theorist of social semiotics. His name is Gunter Kress. Let's look at some of the things he said. So Kress used the general term social semiotics, or rather semiotic resources, semiotic resources, to include all of the different signs we can communicate with. So semiotic resources include language, perhaps that is still the most important, but also images, color, and bodily gestures, okay, which also have a meaning. So if you look at the, um, the image behind me or the text behind me, we can see that there are different things going on. First, we have the linguistic communication, stop violence. So that is words in the English language. Then we have this gesture, meaning stop. Then we have the symbol, which also means stop. And the color red probably also means stop here, like red on the traffic light has the meaning of stop, right? So we can see that we have a gesture, we have a symbol, we have color, and we have language. So four different types of communication going on here, at least. So what Gunter Kress said is that each culture has different semiotic resources that are available. So you have language, you have color, you have um, images. Um, so of course you guys have the Korean language, but you also have other languages that words were loaned or borrowed from those languages you took them into your language and sometimes gave them a different meaning. So each culture has a different set of semiotic resources within with, with which it can make meaning. So we have text, we have images, we have sounds and so on. Um, so we can choose to use these images. These are the potential meanings that we can create. Okay, we decide which ones to use and that's how we communicate that's how we create meaning. Okay, so um, let's have a look at the kinds of questions that social semiotics asks and how it was different or how it is different from the um, previous study of semiotics that we saw with Saussure. So let's remember Ferdinand de Saussure's theory. We have two parts, sign, the sign signified and the signifier. So the signified is the meaning and the signifier is the form. So really you have the form and what does it mean? This was the basic question. But now with social semiotics, we ask different questions. We ask more general questions. Um, so social semiotics also asks, uh, what, does the social semi what does the semiotic resource do? Okay, how is it used? So not simply what does it mean? What does it mean in a specific context? So not, not what is the general meaning, but what is the contextual meaning? How has the meaning and use of the sign changed historically or culturally? What are the different modes of communication and how do they affect communication and meaning? And what do people make it mean? So instead of having the question, what does it mean? As if the meaning of the world is something we discover the question is changed to what do we make it mean? What is the meaning that we create? So these are different and new questions 
that social semiotics enables us to ask. So let's have a look at these things one by one. So let's look at meaning in context. So if you look on um, an internet web page, it might say that the color red has this meaning, the color green has this meaning and so on. But this is too simple. The correct question really is, what does it mean in this context? So in one context, the color green could mean environmentalism. In Islam, the color green is a sacred color. So it's too simple to say, what does the color green mean? Likewise, if we look at something like a red light, the meaning depends on the location or the context. So if we look at the first example, if you're driving a car, red light means stop. Okay, it needs to be understood in the context of driving and the context of the other two colored lights. If we look at the next picture of Amsterdam, red light here has a different meaning. So this is a district where people sell sex for money. So these are sex workers. That's the meaning of a red light here. Um, the next one, um, red light could be used in the context of talking about the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and now again, we're thinking about science, something completely different. So the meaning cannot be decontextualized. A sign has no meaning outside a given context. Or as I said before, the meaning of a sign can never be decontextualized. So this is often the problem. People will take a sentence from an article or a sentence from a speech and they will say, he said this or she said this. But without the context, they often get the meaning wrong and a lot of misunderstandings take place as a result. OK, so we can also look at how particular images are used. So again, this is form. But form for Saussure was mainly a language phenomenon. But of course, now form can mean images. Um, so we could look at how the meaning of the, let's say, form of a woman has changed historically. So if you look at the two images that represent a woman, the form of a woman, a very big change has happened over this period of time. So a social semiotician might ask, how has the meaning changed? What are the social conditions? that enabled the meaning to change? What is the difference in the representation or the form of the woman in the first one and the second image? So of course, many small changes took place in between these two images, many different medias and technologies evolved, society changed a lot. So a social semiotician might ask how a form, a particular form here, the representation of a woman changed throughout history. Um, let's look at the gaze. So the gaze is this essentially, looking at the viewer. Okay, so the gaze became very important in European art. So Rembrandt is one of the representative artists here. So at a certain point in time, the, the figure in the picture started to look back at the viewer. So what did this mean? Why did this occur? So many people think that this happened as a result of a growing idea or concept of individuality. Maybe it also shows a power relationship of some kind because often these people were figures with power or influence. So maybe the fact that they were looking at you was also an indication of their social status or power. So this is the kind of thing we could look at, the gaze and how the meaning has changed. So let's look at it in a different context. So if we look at the representation of the female form in Western art, of course, it was often a nude. But if you look at the two images behind me, the first one is an indirect gaze and the second one is a direct gaze. So do they have the same meaning or is the meaning for the viewer different? So perhaps the first one indicates a more natural form of behavior. Maybe the woman's sexuality is for herself only, but then it is implied indirectly that the gaze is still there for the viewer. So it's a more complex relationship, let's say. In the second one, the woman is gazing directly at the viewer or the artist perhaps. So what is the different message that is being communicated here about women 
of female sexuality. Um, I think the meaning is not exactly the same and the difference in meaning is partly communicated through the gaze. We can see that this also, the gaze became important in media technology. So generally, if you look at the newsreader behind me, they will stare directly at the camera. They will address you directly. Also in movies, sometimes the character will address the camera. So what is going on here when they address you directly? Is that the same as when people are talking and not looking at the camera? So I believe that when people go on to a TV discussion show, they are told not to look at the camera. So you would tend to see the guests discussing with each other. And then you would tend to see the newsreader address you directly as the viewer. So is this a different type of communication that's going on? What is the different meaning that's going on here? And why are they choosing to use it? These are the kind of questions that a social semiotician would ask. So let's have a look at how this image has changed again, changed again, the image of the selfie. So now the person takes a, a picture of themselves, maybe to commodify themselves, to build an online profile, this type of thing, and to curate a profile or a particular image in terms of how they want to be seen by other people they don't even know normally. But if you look at the image going on here, the picture going on here, we can see in the background it says stop Islam. And we have the symbols of mosques, so religious buildings for Muslims. Um, and it says make them illegal, ban them. So it's essentially saying ban Islam. We can also see all the people behind have white skin. The lady in front. Um, she looks very, very happy. She seems to think that they're very, very funny. She also has the smartphone. So maybe the meaning here um, is an inversion of the meaning we sometimes see. So people think that Muslims are very traditional. Maybe sometimes people have the prejudice or stereotype that they're very backward. But I think in this particular image, it is the protesters who want to ban Islam that are very backward. And the woman in front seems more modern with her camera taking the selfie. I don't know. There are many different ways you can analyze, interpret or understand images. That's kind of the point of social semiotics. OK, so let's have a look at multimodality. Let's look at modes and how different modes are used in communication and how different modes affect meaning. OK, so here are some of the modes. And um, these are not all of them, but I chose this PowerPoint because I think it shows nicely what some, some of the main modes are. So you have visual mode, you have the linguistic mode, and um, you have the oral mode, which is sound. You have spatial mode, which is obviously one of the most basic, and you have the gestural mode, a kind of performance of the body. Um, so let's have a look at modes in a little bit more detail. So if you look um, at the first um thing on the powerpoint it is a linguistic expression there was a flood in pakistan okay that's a sentence it could be spoken or written it's in the mode of language or it's linguistic on the right hand side as i'm looking at the powerpoint you have a picture of a flood in pakistan this is visual okay so we might ask a question when and why might we use words in a sentence and when and why might we use an image? What can we do in writing that we can't do with an image and vice versa? So what is a different way the meaning is being communicated? Um, modes are often used together. So we can see here David Cameron, the former prime minister of the UK. He's giving a speech, but he's also gesturing in a very kind of extravagant or dramatic way. So often in the political speech, the gesture is a very important part of the communicative act. So it's not just linguistic, it's non-linguistic. Let's have a look at this one. So often for a war, you will see this kind of map. So the map can easily communicate things like uh, the movement of troops, the, the successes and failures of the war. And um, also we have ob obviously uh, language here. It relates to space and probably also to time, the temporal mode, because some of these events happened before others. Let's have another look at different modes being used together. 
So we have a cartoon strip. So we have the visual mode, the picture. We have the linguistic mode, the sentences. We have the gestural mode in the body language of the dog. And finally, we have the temporal mode. So we have the idea that one of these things happened before another, and then we create a narrative or a story. So we could analyze this by looking at any of these modes of communication. Okay, so um, we can also think about how different modes of communication have different conventions, so different meanings in different cultures. So if we look, for example, at Western culture, then the writing mode um, developed a very high level of value or prestige, particularly among the educated classes after the invention of printing. So often very complex ideas are expressed in written language. Other cultures, for their own reasons and because of their own histories, may value other forms of communication more. So maybe they pass on history or culture or even spiritual teachings verbally. Many spiritual practices are still taught verbally with the person sitting immediately in front of you for a very good reason, I think. And, and certain cultures will have this as the highest or the most esteemed form of communication. So when people create media artifacts, so anything they create, they have choices of using different communication modes. So I can use visual images, I can use written text, I could use sound even. So what we need to do as creators and analysts is be aware of what these different conventions and modes mean in the specific historical, cultural and social contexts. That's really what multimodality and social semiotics is about. OK, let's have a look at the same mode and how that can have different meanings very quickly. So the images behind me also images of the flood that is currently devastating Pakistan in August 2022. Um, the first image um, of the two gentlemen in very traditional clothes, maybe here the image communicated is something like helplessness. Also the buildings shown are very poor, so maybe we get an idea of poverty, helplessness, destitution, and um, this is how the tragedy affected people. The one below it, we see um, two children, one of them rescuing another one. Um, also part of the communication here is the word united. So maybe the photographer chose the image with the word united to communicate something like, we should be united in our response to climate change or these kinds of catastrophes. But of course, the fact that there are children there and perhaps also the helpless man stranded in the background also has a meaning. The picture of people going to work on motorcycles, maybe that says, even though this is a catastrophe, people still struggle to get on with their lives. And the last one immediately behind me of the people entering the lifeboat, maybe this gives you the sense that help is at hand. Even though there is a disaster, there are agencies at hand who can help and deal with the disaster. So maybe this one makes you worry a little bit less. The point is all of these different photographs communicate a different meaning about the same event. Okay, so what does multimodality actually say? Let's look at some of the specific claims before we finish. Um, so firstly, modes and semiotic resources can be used to make immaterial things like thoughts, feelings, emotions, and ideas into real things or material things like sounds, words, images, and so on. So we use our thoughts, our feelings, we translate them into the material form, and then the form is used in communication. Modes and semiotic resources both shape society through communication and are shaped by society. So I think this is very important. This explains how meaning can change, how language can change, how culture can change. So two directions, individuals, people choose, they use their agency to select among the different resources available in their culture. But at the same time, the culture that exists limits the range of choices that they can make. So different types of history, there are different technologies available to communicate, and these limited 
the ways that we could communicate at that time. So this is very useful because um, it broadens the picture of what socio is on about beyond language, but also shows us how language and communication can change. So um, it's partly through our choices, the choices that we make. The choices that we make are very important. So if you look at the example behind me of blackface, the first one shows um, an example of a white entertainer in America using blackface basically to mock or humiliate the black population at a time when they had no civil rights. Of course, a history of slavery and this type of thing. Um, and the second one shows a Korean comedy act, I believe, also dressing up in blackface. So you might think that the second one is quite innocent and has a different meaning from the first. Maybe there is a different social context here, but actually I would say that you empower yourself if you understand the choices that you make. So if I understand the history of racism connected with something like blackface, I can consciously decide not to do that. Okay, and then I can avoid the whole problem of being accused of racism. So you make choices consciously and unconsciously about what you do and what you create. It's better to understand what you're doing and to make them consciously. This gives you more power as an artist, a designer or a creator, writer as well. Um, so as a creator, you have to work out what the best modes are to communicate the message that you want to communicate with your audience. So do I use writing? Do I use sound? Do I use image? Do I use gesture? You need to think about these things when you write, when you speak and when you create. So let's look at one or two more things before we finish. What are the reasons are there for studying communication and communication conventions? So let's think a little bit more about art. As I said before, you're consciously understanding the choices that you make when you create something. This will make you a better creator. It will also help you to explain or articulate the meaning of your work. Now, this is very important because if you become a successful artist, and you cannot explain the meaning of your work clearly, somebody else will explain it for you. Okay, so this gives you the power to communicate about your work and to, to set the framework for establishing what it means. Of course, written communication about artwork is also very important. You will need to do applications for residences or for exhibitions, and you will always have to write about your work. Okay, um, let's return to the painting that we saw at the start. So how can we begin to think about this painting? Hopefully because we studied semiotics or social semiotics, you have some more idea about how we can speak about this. So we could look at the images in the paintings. Do they appear in different paintings? Are they repeated? What kind of conversation exists between the different paintings? What about the language used in the paintings? What about the void areas or the black spaces? What about the empty space? What about the crossing out? What does this mean? Um, so you could look at any one of these things to begin your analysis of this painting by Jean-Michel Basquiat. You could look at the use of text or the use of crossing out or erasure, or you could look at the use of different images. Or you could look at how these things have a conversation together and create a sense of coherence. So all of these are ways that you can begin to start thinking about analyzing this work of art or any other media product. So let's review what we looked at today. We looked at what semiotics were, so the basic sign signifier relationship. We then look at how this was expanded into social semiotics. Then we looked at multimodality, briefly of what the different modes were, and then we looked at why multimodal approaches are useful and useful for artists. Finally, I would like to show you the list of resources I used to compile this video presentation. And there is also one more link on the PowerPoint from my favorite artist, William Kentridge, if you would like to see how he uses social semiotics, semiotic resources to create wonderful artworks then please watch the video. I hope you find it inspiring like I did. Okay, thanks very much for watching my video on social semiotics.